Hey, hello, it's me, John Park, and I just turned up my mic volume, so hopefully that's working. Uh, welcome, it is time for Make Code Live. Uh, and I have a, uh, a pretty fun, interesting, useful project today, I think, inside of Make Code Arcade. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. If you are looking for the chat, uh, we've got some chat going on over in Discord. That's the Adafruit Discord, which is on uh, adafruit.it slash Discord. That'll get you uh, a link to join, free invite. Uh, and also over on our YouTube channel, as well as on the uh, Mixer. You might be joining us from the Microsoft uh, Mixer channel. And uh, the... Interesting thing is, some of you have uh, probably heard by now that Mixer is going to be going away. Microsoft has decided to end the uh, great experiment that was Mixer. And uh, they have stated, I think this was yesterday the news came out, that they'll be focusing on a partnership with Facebook for gaming. So there'll be a FB.GG, which is the Facebook gaming uh, live type of uh, site. And we're not sure yet where this Make Code channel is going to end up, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I put a note in the blog post on Adafruit that you can also find us on YouTube, on Twitch, on our Facebook, and on Periscope. Uh, those are the main places where we also stream this out. Um, so look for news, uh, both from the Microsoft Make Code team as well as on the Adafruit blog about where you can join us to watch this next time if you were uh, not interested in those other places. You wanted to see it on the actual official Make Code channel. So uh, stay tuned. I may even already have an email about this that I haven't checked yet. So who knows? This is like cutting edge uh, info that we have. Um, so let's see. I'll just check in with our, uh, our Discord and Mixer chat to make sure that uh, levels sound good. It seems like uh, no complaints about the audio. That's good. And uh, so why don't we get started? So uh, I actually have a, uh, a really cool treat for us this week. You know that uh, if you followed this show, I've been doing weekly uh, status videos from members of the Make Code team, uh, usually one or two minute updates on a feature uh, or an upcoming uh, release or uh, a little tip or a trick. Uh, but this time I had asked... Jacqueline, who is the project manager for MakeCode, if she could do a bit of a uh, video on using MakeCode inside of Minecraft. Uh, so you've never seen me do this because I don't know how. I haven't tried it yet. I, I don't have the, uh, the educational version of Minecraft installed, although that may change soon because I'm pretty excited about what I've seen. Uh, but if you didn't know, uh, Jacqueline and her... A uh, small child, Cyan, will be explaining a bit about make code for Minecraft as well as showing a sample project. Uh, so this is a bit of a longer uh, video. Usually, like I said, I've run these uh, one or two minute videos, but this is going to be about uh, a little over 10 minutes uh, of a dive into using make code inside of Minecraft uh, and a sample project. And then after that, I'll be here the whole time, but after that, I'll come back to you over this camera and this device, uh, and we'll be taking a look at a really cool Make Code Arcade uh, tip and trick, really. This is something uh, that I saw on the Arcade forums, and I did a little mini segment on my Make Code Minute about it, but I want to do a deeper dive into how you can have your scenes inside of Make Code Arcade appear to have a sort of three-dimensional aspect to them by allowing your character to go behind and in front of objects depending on where we are on the screen as well as creating collisions with objects so we don't go through them if we try to come from, from uh, above or below. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, uh, let's bring on Jacqueline and Cyan. Hi everyone, I'm Jacqueline Russell from the Make Code team and I'm here with Cyan. And today we're gonna to show you a little bit of coding in Minecraft. So um, in order to code in Minecraft, you need to have Minecraft Education Edition. Um, so Cyan, do you wanna tell people what is Minecraft Education Edition? Minecraft Education Edition is basically um, 
Minecraft where you can where you can learn to code. That's right. Yeah. So regular Minecraft doesn't have coding yet. Um, but if you get the education edition, if you go to education.minecraft.net, you can download it from there. You will need an Office 365 education account to log in to Minecraft Education Edition. Uh, but once you're logged in, um, you can ask your school or your teacher if you have one, an account. Once you're logged in, um, you can access all of the educational materials um, and different worlds within uh, Minecraft. And you can code. So, uh, so today, what are we going to code, Cyan? We are going to code a rainbow beacon, and so and so that we will know know um, where this village is when we go off exploring into the distance. Beacons are like signal, are like basically like uh, landmarks. Landmarks, that, like a really tall tower or something, yeah. right? And so that will. We're like, so that like if you're in creative and you can fly you're flying like this and you're off in the distance and you're like where's my yeah, home yeah where and then, did and I... then you can just and then you can just see like yeah uh and then you can just see like your you're thing. like where did i leave my home where was it and you can fly around the world and you'll be able to see your beacon right yeah because it's really tall and it goes above the clouds and it goes above the clouds so uh, but beacons can help if you don't travel yeah. too too far if you don't travel um, off of the ends of the earth You'll be able to see your beacon from a really far distance And so that's what we're going to be coding today is a really tall beacon um, and um, What's also going to be different about this beacon cyan? It's gonna be rainbow Woo! Rainbow color that's right so, um, so we're gonna build a beacon right here. So tell me, Cyan, how's, how do we get to code? Press C on the keyboard. Press C on the keyboard to open up Code Builder. And if you have a touch screen, you can also press the, um, your little agent at the top. It looks like this. Yeah, like that guy. So then um, we're gonna create a new project. What should we name this? Um, beacon. Beacon. Rainbow Beacon. Rainbow Beacon, okay. Okay, and um, we get into our code editor here. So the first thing we wanna do is um, we wanna build a rainbow. And to do that, we're gonna use an array. So Cyan, do you remember what an array is? An array is like it's like the a way to arrange things. That's right. It's like what we the analogy we used before was like uh, a row of mailboxes, it's where you can put different things in the different slots. So if you click on the advanced part of the toolbar on the toolbox, um, you'll find the arrays category here, and we're gonna click this open, and we're gonna grab this first block, this set list to array. So we've got our um, on start. We've got an array list. Uh, we set, renamed it to be um, Rainbow, and now we need to populate it with blocks. So we're going to grab a block from our blocks toolbox drawer and just drop it right in here. And uh, what's the first color of a rainbow? Red. Red. So then orange, then yellow, then green. Yep. Then blue, so then find red. a red block. How about this red concrete? Yeah, and then we can just right click duplicate. and duplicate. And then we're gonna put it into the next one. And then we're gonna select orange. Yep, and then press the plus. You can press that a couple of times if you want to make more. Yep, because how many how many colors are in a rainbow? Do we know? Uh, six. Six or seven, right? Uh, so we're gonna right click and select duplicate. Right click. Duplicate. Mm -hmm. So this one we're gonna be yellow, right? Yellow. This one is going to be green. Let's do this. Green light. lime. Green. And then, then what comes next? Blue. Blue. Light and blue. blue. And then and purple. Then... Let's do this magenta. That magenta. Nice. That's perfect. So we've got our rainbow. That'll tie into the red. We've got our array of colors here, which is our rainbow. And then um, when we, what, what command should we use? 
to run um, this? Uh, let's do on chat command um, R. R for rainbow. R for rainbow. I like to make it nice and short. Yeah, tell me why. Because... Then you only have, like, one letter to press? Yeah, and it's faster. It's faster. Okay. All right, and then we're going to set a variable to be the location. So let's go ahead and click on Make a Variable from the Variables Toolbox drawer, and let's call this Location. Um, and then we're going to set the location to be... Um, we wanted to start the beacon to start right next to the player, right? Um, and so if we go to the Positions Toolbox drawer, let's grab this plus block because we're going to actually add the player world position. So if I go to player, I think it's here. Yep. Do you see this player world position? So this yeah. is the position of the player. So we're going to put that right here. And we're going to put we're going to put it right next to the player's world position. So let's make that like which which one? So this is east west. This is um, up down and this is north south. What do you think? Um Maybe we add one one block east west of the player, just so it's right next to the player. All right, and then we are going to um, loop through our array and build this. So to do that, we need a repeat loop. So go to the loops toolbox drawer and grab a repeat loop. Um, how many times should it repeat? How high do we want this? Um, ten. You want a 10 and see how high it goes? Maybe we can add more if it's not high enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna go through our, um, our rainbow. And so to do that, there's actually a special loop just for arrays that is this one. For element value in list, which is the array list. So we're gonna use this one and drop it in here. Um, and instead of list, what do, what do we call our array? Rainbow. Rainbow, yep. So, and then we're going to place our blocks. So we go to blocks, grab a place block, and drop it in here. And instead of this grass block, we want to actually place the value in our array. So we're just going to drop that in here. And instead of this, um, this player location, what uh, what do we want to use? One, oh yeah, location. We want to use our location, right? So drop that in here. So we're going to place no. the value of our block, which is going to be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, or purple, at this location, which is next to the player. Yeah. All right. And then we need to increment the location because we're going to add it. What we're going to place it one on top of each other, right? Yay. So um, what? It does. It has that. Money. Yeah, because it's it's not a location. We need to get a lo we need to get a position. So again, we're gonna grab this um, sort of plus block hurry, for the hurry, position hurry before the thingy. Yay! <laughs> and we're gonna add one above the current location, right? And which one goes up? This middle one, right? And add one to that. So we're gonna set the location to one above the current location. And then it's going to loop through again, and it's going to do this um, over, and over, over, and over and over each time for our array, and, and, and then it's also going to do it ten times. Over so how many over and over how many blocks and over high is this going to be? And over and over and over and over and over. Okay. Do you know how many blocks high this is going to be? Can you calculate? Six times ten is sixty. Very good. Yeah, excellent. So it's going to be sixty blocks high. Is that high enough? Do you think? Okay, let's try it out. Should we try it out? Multiplying with tens is easy. It's easy, okay. So now let's run this. What, what was our command again? R. R. Whoop, there's our beacon. Look at that. Yay, rainbow. Wow, super cool. Look at our rainbow beacon. Do you see what I mean by the purple type? ties into the red yeah that's beautiful I love it can I destroy it now <laughs> hey do you think that's high enough I feel like we should go even higher yeah above the clouds above the clouds right so destroy <laughs> let's uh, let's add our let's add um, oh 
Guys, watch this. Hmm. Woo! <laughs> I love I love jumping from high places because it really feels like you're falling. Yeah, it does. Okay, let's add one to our let's add to our code. So, uh, how high do you think we should make this? Twenty. So even so, that's double. Yeah. Okay. Double the trouble. Double the trouble. Okay. <laughs> so let's get over here and um, make another one. So let's see. What was our. And then enter. Whoop, there it is. So let's go up. Whoa, look at that. And it keeps going, going and, and going. going. <laughs> And going and going and wow. going. Wow, that is a going, really tall rainbow going beacon. Going and going and <laughs> oh yeah, it stopped. So that for sure we can see from a f long way away, right? Oh, I can barely see that. So let's see. Uh, Whee! <laughs> oh no, I missed it. <sighs> cool. At okay. least I broke some blocks. That's a really cool beacon. All right, so the code for this is actually um, available if you want to build it yourself. Um, can I just show on the home page uh, of Code Builder? You can scroll down and look for some examples here. Um, and I think it's there it is, Rainbow Beacon. So this is an example ooh, ooh. of the Rainbow Beacon that we just built. A rainbow Beacon. So I hope that was helpful for everyone. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll hand it back over to you, John. Bye. There we go. We're back. Uh, that is fantastic. I, uh, you can see why I'm so excited about uh, trying out Make Code for Minecraft. That is so much fun. Thank you uh, so much to Cyan and Jacqueline for demonstrating that for us. And also a very useful... Um, uh, thing to have because if you've ever gone super far away in Minecraft and then wondered where the heck your village is uh, That's a really nice way to do it um, and uh, You know normally in Minecraft you'd go into uh, Creative mode and build a a large tower uh, But it would be pretty tedious I think to do a rainbow where you're switching the color of the block every time as you build some people get really fast with this But I'm not uh, so the idea of uh, encapsulating that in a little loop and, and uh, an array of blocks uh, or you know, of, of uh, Minecraft blocks inside of the make code blocks um, to build really quickly is, is super exciting. Uh, okay, so now I thought uh, we would get into uh, the project that I wanted to build this week. So like I mentioned, uh, the idea here is to show how you can create a, an illusion of uh, depth in your games using Z-Depth. So here I've made a um, little alien kind of character guy, sort of quickly. Uh, he's mostly a rectangle that I've carved some parts out of. And uh, you can see in a sort of default scene here, this is what we expect. There are two sprites on the screen in a background. And when we move uh, an item, it will go on top of or below uh, the other item and sort of do that consistently. So either we're above it or below it, and this is what we're used to. Um, so if we take a look at, I'm going to expand these blocks and format my code here. So let's take a look at, I'm going to throw my glasses so I can see this better. There we go. So if you take a look at what's happening uh, in a sort of default scene here, I'm creating uh, a scene by putting in a little background color. And then I have two sprites. One I've named rectangle. Uh, and that one just looks sort of like this tall door with a red bottom uh, at, at the base of it. And then when I uh, create that, the next thing I do is I set its position on screen, X, Y. And uh, then I'm going ahead and creating my own sprite, which was this little alien guy, setting his position. And then you'll notice I'm setting his Z depth. Now, I'm going to simplify this for a second. This is what setting Z depth normally looks like. Z is, if you think of X and Y as being X horizontal and Y up and down, or north and south, on this screen, on this two-dimensional screen, then Z is that third dimension that goes in and out of the screen. Um, in a default scene, the 
order of these can be changed by just uh, adding or subtracting from z-depth. So let's take uh, a duplicate of this block and I'm gonna set the rectangles z-depth. Uh, let's set the rectangles z-depth to one. And now we'll try this scene again. And now you can see uh, the z-depth starts at zero and comes out positive uh, towards, towards you, towards the user out of the screen. Um, so that works pretty well for allowing me to, to have my character behind this, but what if we uh, think of this as sort of a, a perspective, a slanted perspective scene, and I want to be in front of this now when I'm sort of below uh, its bottom, and I want to be behind it when I'm above its bottom. So uh, the way that we're going to do that is automate the z-depth to be based on the bottom of the sprite. So in the, uh, in the scene, the, the dimensions uh, of x and y actually start at the origin, which is the upper left-hand corner uh, here. That's 0, 0. Uh, and you can see this when you go and use these positioning blocks. So um, x starts at 0 and makes its way up to 160, and y starts at zero and makes its way down to 120. So that's the dimensions of this screen here. Um, I'm gonna undo that because I don't remember what, oh, it's not gonna let me undo. It's gonna make me undo every every number. So we'll live with that. Uh, let me just drop the block down a little bit, a little bit more. So since the numbers on Y start low and go high, uh, what we can do is we can couple that to the Z depth. So as the object moves down, it also moves out in front of other objects. So the higher up it is on the screen, the further back it is, essentially. Um, so let's, let's demonstrate this now. The, um, the COBOL kid is the uh, coder who showed this trick inside of the Make Code Arcade forum, which is forum.makecode.com. And uh, the COBOL kid has used this in a number of games and then also created a great explainer scene um, that, that goes through all of this. And so I just wanted to, to learn it myself and break it down a bit. So uh, what we'll do is we'll set the rectangle's z-depth to be its bottom of the sprite. So uh, when we think of the xy position of a sprite, the xy position of the sprite's center is at the middle of the sprite. So we actually want to deal with what the bottom of the sprite is. And thankfully, there's a uh, block for this. If I go into sprites uh, and grab this sort of info block about a sprite and drag that into where the z-depth is, I can change which sprite I'm talking about here by saying rectangle. And rather than uh, asking for its x position, we could ask for its y position and a whole bunch of other things, including its bottom. So that's the lowest pixel on the sprite. Um, and so now the bottom of that, we can actually figure this out. Let's, uh, let's set this to be at, let's say 60 on Y is where the, the rectangle starts. And if I look at the, um, you can see it just barely at the bottom there. If I look at the sprite here, it's 20 by 80. I know that's getting, getting blocked by the screen a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, so 80, is the height of that sprite. And if we start at the center and go down, it's 40 pixels from the center to the bottom. So that means that its bottom right now is at uh, 60 plus 40. So its bottom is at 100, uh, which means right now, if I try to move my little alien, it's gonna be behind it always. If I change its Z depth to be, let's say 101, that should put it at a z-depth that's higher or further out on the screen than that rectangle is, if I've done my math properly. Okay, good. So now we're in front of it. Um, and what we want to do is the same thing we did with the rectangle. We want to do that with our sprite, this alien sprite, whose name is my sprite. So if I grab this block that I already had in here and, and I took out to demonstrate. If I put that back in here, instead of saying the z-depth is locked at 101, uh, instead it's going to be based on the bottom of the my sprite. Now the my sprite is, I think I made these equal. So this is also 80 high. 
Um, and as that bottom goes down, um, we want to capture that bottom position and use that to push the z-depth out. Now, the reason we can't, we won't see any, any big change right now is that this is the on start loop. So this is only setting it at the beginning. What we want to do is every time the game updates, check and see has that changed. Has the y, uh, yeah, the y position of the sprite that we're moving around, the alien, changed, and therefore we're going to propagate that change into its z depth, therefore pushing it out of the screen. Uh, so if we look at um, this on game update block, I have it empty right now, and this comes right from here, game, on game update. It's a really important block because it's one of the things that lets you check the status of things and update things every time the game updates internally, which is very, uh, very, very many times a second it's doing this. So what I've uh, got is that same uh, set my sprites Z depth to the sprites bottom that we used before. So I'll drop that in there. And now what you'll see is when the bottom of the sprite is above the bottom of the rectangle, we're behind it. And then when we come down in front or below, we're in front. So when we're below it, we're in front of it. And when we're above it, we're behind it. So now it looks kind of like a two and a half dimensional set, like a theater set where we have a set piece that's that's hanging almost that we can go behind and we can come and go in front of it. Now, um, one issue that we'll find with this is that at this point, we don't have a way to prevent our sprite from going through uh, the sort of center of this. So what I mean by that is when I move my alien, right at that moment when the Z depth is equal, one of them wins. One of them, even though they're both trying to be in the same spot, one of them is winning. It seems like the alien is. If we zoom in, we can see a little better the, the bases of them. That's why I put this little line at the base of them. So you can see right now we're um, one above. So, so the alien is behind. Now we're equal. The alien is popping forward and now it's staying forward. So um, this is sort of a, a really cool secondary trick. And this one's uh, a little more elaborate to set up. But what we're going to do is we're going to use a uh, sort of a conditional block to check and see when these two sprites are overlapping if we have the z depth in front and the y below, then we can no longer move up. We're stuck in front of it. And same if we're z depth behind and y above, we can't move below the base of it, if that makes sense. So it'll make it feel like this is a, a real object that we're, block, we're blocked by. Um, so let's take a look at how to set this up. And I've already created it because it's a, a, a bit um, elaborate to, to rebuild this from scratch and get it right. And I didn't want to risk that. So uh, what I'll do is talk our way through it. So first of all, you'll notice I'm using a function. And the reason this isn't currently working, the reason we're not bumping into the door right now is because I'm not actually calling this function. So the function never runs on its own unless it's asked to. So nowhere in here do you see that function being called. So it's sort of a chunk of code sitting here abandoned on its own waiting to be called. So we will enable it in a minute. But first, let's take a look at how, how this works. So the first thing that matters here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of deconstruct this. The first thing that matters here is this. If my sprite overlaps with the rectangle, then we're going to do something. Um, so you can do things like destroy a sprite with this. So here's, here's a very simple example. If I go into sprites and pick this destroy rectangle, that means as soon as my alien over, overlaps, we're just going to, oh, we're not, we're not calling the function though. <laughs> let's, let's call the function. So, um, here it is call collide with door is what I named it. And I'm going to place that into the game update loop. So every time the game updates, it checks to see 
hey, are we overlapping these two sprites? So once it checks that, oh, we have a phone call. Uh, once it checks that uh, condition and it turns out to be true, then we'll do this destroy rectangle. So if we come over here, boom, we've just destroyed the rectangle. Hold on, oh, let's see if that phone stops. All right, I never get calls. Oh, we're getting a call. a junk call too. <laughs> it was none of you. It was just a, a spam call. Uh, so now I need to reset my scene to get that back. But you'll see that it is um, updating and checking for this condition. And when this condition exists, it does something. It'll do whatever's inside of here. So I'm going to get rid of that because that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do if we reset the scene, is block block my movement. So I can't go up or down when I'm, or I can't go down when I'm behind it and I can't go up when I'm in front of it. So the next block, I'm gonna bring all of this in uh, and then pull out a section here and a section here. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is if the two are overlapping with each other, um, we want to make sure that the bottoms are, are uh, either above or below. So this is how we're going to figure out if we're dealing with coming from the top or coming from the bottom. Uh, so what we do is we check and see, okay, is the sprite's bottom greater than the rectangle's bottom? And right now the sprite's bottom is going to be less than the rectangle's bottom because we start at the top at zero. And if we come up from the bottom, it'll be greater than. So what happens when its first condition there is met? Oh, let's, let's move things over a little bit. I'm zoomed way in. Here we go. Okay, so this first one here, this is when the uh, sprite is below because its bottom number is higher than the rectangle. When that's the case, we're, we're then going to check and see, are they pretty close together? Uh, because we don't want to stop our upward movement when we've got, uh, let, me, let me move this here, when we've got enough clearance, right? He should be able to move. It's just kind of up there when his foot would hit it that we want to stop him. So what we're doing here is we're checking if the sprite bottom number is, uh, uh, if we take the sprite bottom number and subtract from it the rectangle bottom number, and that value is less than two, so that means we're within two pixels of the bottom, then we will set the sprite's bottom position to the current bottom position plus two. So that means we're essentially gonna bump it down. So every time we get too close, we'll just kinda push him back down. Um, let's see, should this work? This should work right now, right? Yeah, there we go. So you can see, when I try to get up there, I'm bumping into it, right? Because those two numbers became within uh, the toler tol tolerable distance, uh, easy for you to say, and then we push it back down. You'll notice I can come through it from the top because we don't have that second condition. So let's bring that in. Okay, so this is now the full collide with door function. So this says um, when they're overlapping, we check if we're above it or below it. And then if we're uh, above it, we're gonna bounce up. If we're below it, we're gonna bounce down. So let's try this out now. And I'll, I'll make this a larger screen. Okay, we can go behind it, in front of it, but when we're in front, we can't push through it. If we get off to the side, we can, because there's no overlap. Right here, there's no overlap. Now there's an overlap, so my toe is getting stuck. Same with from behind. We're bouncing into it. As soon as my foot's out of the way, then we can get through. Okay. Well, this is pretty cool, and uh, what I want to do is show you this um, with, just to, to sort of clarify things, uh, with some numbers associated with this. So uh, let's take a physics block, which is in sprites. Scroll down to set my sprite stay in screen. This is one of these mysterious ones that you kind of just have to know that there are other options in it, unfortunately. Uh, 
this one will normally set your sprite to stay in the screen so it can't go through the walls, which uh, the edges of the screen, which is nice. Uh, but what we're going to use is this show physics, and we'll turn that on, and we'll also duplicate that, and we'll turn on the rectangles sprites, and let's, uh, or physics, so let's just drop these down at the bottom here. So what we'll see now is some numbers show up when it starts. So uh, remember, I made these the same size just to make this example easy to follow. So that means right now they have um, equal bottom pixel numbers, which are just whatever you see there plus 40. So essentially right now they're both have their bottom at 100. Uh, now I can't show those with the physics, but we can show their centers. Uh, so now when I get above, I can go past it. But when I come too far below, we get pushed out and you can see uh, one is at 60, one's at 58. So they're within that distance of two and that means we activate the collision detection. Same if I come up from the underside and we bounce off of it because we're within two. It's going from 63 to 62 and the other is at 60. Um, so now what I wanted to do was show a, um, a slightly more realistic example or a more developed example, let's say, um, which is a little scene I made earlier. And let's take a look. Okay, so you can see I'm using some nice um, background. There's a gallery background that I used and then modified a little bit to add some shading and some clouds and a little river in the front. Uh, and I'm using one of the stock trees, the kind of flappy bird tree, and then I made a, a variation of that. Um, if you look at the on start here, you'll see some of this is pretty similar. Uh, for example, I'm making a sprite and I'm setting the Z depth to be a certain number. Um, and I also am using the same sort of collision detection block uh, or similar collision detection block right here. Set sprite of kind player overlaps other sprite of kind set piece. Now, the last time we did this, we used a function, but this time you'll notice uh, when you get into more uh, elaborate examples and more complicated scenes, we don't always want to replicate the same code over and over again. We get a really large scene that way. Um, so instead what I've done is I have uh, created a number of tree sprites using a function. So you'll see here where it says call create tree and then these two numbers, and I'm doing that three times. That's what's building my three trees in the scene. So let's look at that function, call create tree. You'll notice that in some ways this is pretty similar to how I created the rectangle before. So we're creating a sprite, we're setting it to a certain position, we're turning its z-depth to be the same as its bottom pixel. Um, and you'll also notice some strange stuff like this if percentage block and this uh, set tree to stay in screen. What's going on with that? Well, uh, what I decided I wanted to do is since I'm calling this three times, I wanted to get a randomized set of uh, trees. So I have two different tree graphics, so I can get a randomization on the screen. You'll notice every time we reload the game over here, we're going to get uh, a random chance for the trees to be different from each other. Each tree has a 50% chance of being one of those two designs. Okay, and so the way this is done is that we're calling in on start, call create tree. These numbers that I've put in here, these are the X and Y positions. So when I call the create tree function, X and Y are input and those become the positions. So we can decide where they're going in advance. That's not random. Uh, but each time it's called, it goes through and it says if, and then it just is this really cool, uh, I think it's in math, this 50% chance down at the bottom here. It's, uh, it starts out as 0% chance, so it'll never happen. Um, but we can adjust that value if we want so that we, we can roll the dice on which one we're gonna get. Um, so when I'm creating those, you, you will see that I'm using a unique um, asset tag here, which I called set piece. So I'm thinking again, kind of like in a theater, you might have a, a flat or a scrim or a set piece. So I'm calling these set pieces um, we could have used anything like food or enemy or projectile, anything other than player. And the reason is I want to use this um, tag to create a list of all of the possible trees in the scene. Reason being, I don't know their names. We're creating them with a function rather than explicitly. So normally when we create something, here I've got my character called a Gary. 
uh, we give it a name. And if we create one tree, we might call it tree. But if you're proceduralizing this and, and uh, creating three, five, 15 trees, you don't want to replicate that code and give them unique names. So instead, we can um, use them through their asset tag um, or their, their type. So this um, block here, this overlap uh, block, this exists right here in sprites. Um, we actually use this one a lot. Overlap sprite of kind player with sprite of other sprite of kind, whatever it is. So in this case, uh, we can pick from which type of thing we overlap with, and, and I'm choosing this set piece. So um, then what I'm doing is I have a variable called near tree, and I created that originally uh, in my start block, and I gave it the name tree as, as its original value. Uh, that value doesn't really matter that much other than I want it to exist when we start. Um, and I'll show you in a moment why we're doing that. But, but essentially, when we collide with the tree, we're renaming uh, or we're recasting this variable near tree to be equal to whatever tree we've just overlapped with. So this is a way, if you wanted to do something like um, tag a, an object or be able to pick up an object and you have multiple objects of that kind, um, we're basing this variable on whichever one we've touched last and that allows us to refer to that object over and over again without knowing its name in advance. Then this looks the same as before. This is the same stuff about collisions. Um, so let's, let's take a look at how that works so far. You see I've got a little Gary here. Gary can move around. Oh, I've broken something, haven't I? <laughs> let's go look. Let's go look at what I've broken here. Uh, something's not working. Let's see. Are we calling? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, one thing I wanted to look at was this Gary bottom position in the console. So you can see, and that might that could be causing an issue for us, but you can see um, Gary is not as tall as those other objects. So let's see, when he's at 64, uh, his bottom is at 72. What is that, eight pixels? Um, yeah, eight pixels. So if we look at uh, his height, he's gonna be a 16 pixel high guy. Um, so let me let me hide that console. I don't know if that's causing issues, but it could be. Let's try him out. Also notice sometimes it's possible to have the character moving too quickly. Okay, yeah, that was it. I think I was just causing uh, a little bit of a delay in it noticing because I was, I was logging that console value and he had a chance to get through the tree. So um, hiding that, that block helps us out a lot. So now you can see he does the same thing as our previous example with the alien in the door. Uh, you also notice I made kind of a little transparency in this tree so you can see through it. It's got a big hole in it. I don't think that tree is going to make it. Uh, but you can see our character's face kind of appear there. Okay, and let me turn off that physics. We don't need that anymore. That was just helpful during debugging. So we can go to our start block and just turn off show physics, how about? Um, so uh, two other interesting things are happening here. And these are again from the same example uh, that the COBOL kid did in his blue ox scene. Uh, we have this notion of staying, with, staying on the ground. Uh, and that is by just checking the position of the character and uh, when it reaches, uh, when it's greater than a certain value or lower than a certain value, lower going up, greater going down, we just set the bottom position uh, to be a fixed value. So that keeps the character from going off the edge of the ground here, even though that's not the edge of the screen. So there's a convenient block, remember stay in screen that we can use to stay within the physical bounds of the screen. But in this case, we have this horizon line and I have this little creek at the bottom. So um, those are two more functions that I'm calling on game update and they look like this, very simple. So if we uh, have the bottom greater than 115, we've gone down too low and then we'll just set the bottom to 115. It just keeps him stuck right there. Same with going up, uh, up towards the top. So the, the numbers are diminishing when we are uh, lower than 55, that means we're trying to reach that threshold towards the top of the screen beyond the horizon, then we set that bottom position back down. Um, okay, so 
that is well and good, but what's this, what was this business that, that I talked about of why I want to know the name of a tree? Uh, so this allows me, when I overlap a tree, to know the name of that tree, and then I can interact with it. And the way I decided I wanted, in, wanted to interact with this, and I, I promise you this is not a fully developed game yet, so there's no real logic to why we're going to do this, but what the heck, it could end up being useful, it could end up being a gameplay mechanic. What I decided to do, let me collapse a block here, uh, is allow the character to push these trees left and right. So when I am overlapping a tree, if I press the A button, it's going to check and see, is Gary overlapping the, the near tree, which is the one that we um, named when we had the collision. So if we're overlapping it, then we can change the near tree's X value by 4. And if we press the B button, it'll be by negative 4. So that means, let's make this big again. Right now, I can head over here and press the A button, and I'm pushing the tree. Now, you notice when I'm no longer overlapping, uh, we can't do it. That's why, that's why the code checks for that overlap. So I can push it, and I can pull it if I press the other button. And if I move with it... So maybe this is a game where you have some object that you're hiding behind to avoid being seen. Uh, and you'll see it'll work for any tree... So long as we're overlapping it, it'll pick the, the one we're overlapping. You can be in front of it, too. Uh, because that variable changes every time. So uh, if we restart that, they'll go back to their original positions. You'll notice we get some, some randomized tree art uh, because we're using that 50% chance block. And now we can push the trees around. Uh, now you'll notice the trees are getting stuck. And uh, you usually don't think about giving your set pieces a, uh, a limit on where they can go. But since we can push these around, uh, I'm setting the trees when they get created. Where'd that block go? Create tree. Let's open this up. When the trees are getting created, I'm actually setting their stay in screen value to on. Um, now, we can even do weirder stuff. Like, instead of stay in screen, let's try uh, bounce on wall. Let's see if that, that works. I haven't tried this yet, so it'll be interesting to see if it works. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to push. No, it doesn't want to bounce. I think it's not uh, moving. Uh, it could be... Uh, no, I don't know why. It might be because it doesn't have any velocity to it. So we might need to try something else, like when I'm overlapping it, I give it a, a velocity. Um, let's try that, in fact, because I, th I think it's fun to see how, how some of the process of, um, of trying out your ideas works. So, so right now when I press the A button, it just moves uh, by updating X. But I think I need a velocity. I need it to be actually traveling. So it'll just be one push and then it'll go. Um, so let's go to sprites. Uh, set. How about my sprite X to zero? What I'm going to do... So let's remove that one and change this to be the near tree and the velocity on X. Uh, and let's give it a velocity of, let's say, 25. So now, boink, it's going to bounce. <laughs> so again, this, this could be a puzzle. We can do this with all these trees, too. This could be a... Um, a puzzle solving mechanic. Let's go fix the other one too, because I, I like this. So I want to, I want to be able to um, pull the trees as well. So let's change this block out here, and I'll just duplicate this and set the velocity to negative twenty-five. Okay, let's go full screen. And now my little Gary can come around here. Can't go through it. You know what? Let's just move it. Uh, boom. You'll go that way. This one will go the other way. See ya. And that one will go that way. Uh, and now these will, these will do their thing till the end of time. Uh, these have no reason to, to stop moving. Uh, you'll notice all of the mechanism for hiding behind them or going in front of them still works because it's it's active and based on the Z 
uh, depth, which is based on the bottom pixel of each object. Uh, I can probably stop these by hitting them with an impulse in the other direction, which would neutralize. Nope, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not adding to or subtracting. I'm just setting it to be that. So let's try that. Let's see what happens. Can I add to the velocity um, and subtract from the velocity? So here we're going to set the velocity to, and then we're going to... Either there's a, there's a change. Yeah, we can do that. Let's do change by. Rather than set it, we can change it. Uh, this means we could also probably get it going real fast. So I'm going to change the near tree velocity on x by, how about, 20. Uh, duplicate that. Let's get rid of this one. We can chuck these. We don't need them anymore. They were boring anyway. So we'll duplicate this change near tree velocity x by negative 20. Okay, let's test that out. So now what I should be able to do is, let's make this bigger, add to the speed and stop it. So when I hit, hit the button when it's going in the opposite direction, we can stop the thing. Same here, I'll send it left and then stop it. Oh, I sent it going shuttling along <laughs> the same way. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, I hit it twice. Let's see, yeah, I can get these things really cooking. Go, 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 go. I really feel like there should be a um, curling game or something. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that really is how curling works because I don't think you get multiple shoves at the little thing, but that's going to be my my uh, winter time project, I think, is I'm going to make a curling game and make code. Um, so, oh, I made it stop. Let's go get it go cooking again. Go, 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 go. And let's see, I think that covers it. That's, um, we went a little beyond the, the, the basic idea, but I'm, I'm so glad that Cobalt Kid shared the Blue Ox project, which, by the way, I'll show that. And I think I, uh, yeah, we can show it here. This is, this is the original post under arcade.makeco.com. And uh, Blue Ox says, using Z-Depth to create a 3D scene. Talks about how it was done and why. And if we uh, click on that link, it'll open it up. And you can check it out at first. We have this cute blue ox who can't go past this rock or this tree, but goes behind them and can't go above this horizon line. And if you hit edit code, you can check out all the code, including uh, he did some nice uh, little switches, sort of debug types of switches uh, to, oh, this is my version. I, I've, I've uh, edited it, so we've lost some of the functions. So. Uh, that's just stored in my cache, unfortunately, but you'll you'll see the real version if you try that yourself. Um, let me go back here. So that was my inspiration for it. Uh, thank you for for bearing with me as I try my own uh, fun version of it. You can see it's a really good mechanic to to create a game uh, from, and it's uh, actually fairly simple, as you can see here. This is not a ton uh, of of code to create this especially when we throw away some extra bits that aren't being used. Um, and that is how you can make a sort of pseudo 3D scene or 2.5D, it's sometimes called, 2.5 dimensional scene, uh, inside of Make Code Arcade. Uh, and you could also put this onto hardware if you wanted to try it out on a um, uh, Pi Gamer or Pi Badge or Kittenbot Meowbit or any of the other hardware uh, this, this would transfer to. And uh, these types of games look really cute. One thing that I have not seen done, and it might be difficult uh, currently without doing a lot of extra sprites, but you could create animated sprites so that the objects become smaller as they go away and bigger as they come towards the screen. Uh, right now, we don't have any scaling per se, so I think you'd, you'd, you could do that, but just by creating levels of detail uh, of, your, of your objects uh, in animation so that you could push objects uh, forward and backward in the scene and, and really feel that 3D sense. Uh, all right, so I think we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Make Code Live today. Thank you to Jacqueline and Cyan for showing the Make Code for Minecraft. Very excited about that. I can't wait to try it myself. Uh, and we will see you next week, maybe on a different channel. I don't recall exactly when Mixer is turning off the, uh, the lights over there, but uh, 
You can definitely catch us on the Adafruit YouTube, Adafruit Facebook, Adafruit Periscope, Adafruit Twitch. Uh, and we'll see where Microsoft uh, Make Code broadcasts will move to uh, soon. And uh, we'll put up a blog post uh, about that when it is uh, when we know. Or check the chat here if you're on Mixer. We'll probably have an announcement of some kind when that happens. So uh, for Microsoft Make Code and Adafruit, I'm John Park. This has been Make Code Live, and I will see you next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, breaking news. I'm, I'm not done streaming yet. I just found out Twitch. There's going to be a move to Twitch for next week, uh, and that's going to be uh, twitch.tv slash msmakecode. So that's where you'll find us, twitch.tv slash msmakecode. There you go. That's the latest info. Thanks. Bye-bye.